good afternoon it's friday the 12th of june 2020 just after one o'clock welcome to uk column news your host today mike robinson myself brian gerrish uh, well we're just going to get straight on here brian with uh, with excess mortality once again and just uh, remind everybody of this graph uh, the dotted orange line where the uh, lockdown was implemented uh, and we're alleging that these uh, the the red shaded area there represents uh, lockdown deaths the question is how is this happening? Uh, and well, we've had some uh, statements from people that have been affected by this. So let's just have a look at some patient testimony here. So there's person one saying, after experiencing serious recurring uh, cardiovascular issues during lockdown, uh, I finally contacted my GP this week. However, I was informed by the receptionist that the surgery would only be performing telephone appointments these days, uh, but that there would be no more calls for the rest of the day. It was only 10.30 a.m. I insisted that it was serious and she then relented and said a doctor would call me later that day. Later on, the doctor called and informed me that she would book uh, me in for a heart diagnostic, but I would likely have to wait a few months for the appointment. Uh, so this is a heart issue uh, because the hospital's resources were all being focused on COVID pandemic for the foreseeable future. I cannot tell you how devastated it was to hear this. No other options were offered. What can I do now with care being rationed to extreme levels I can only imagine how many other people are being fobbed off like this. Uh, why are we clapping for the NHS if the NHS has closed its doors to potentially millions who are desperate for urgent care? This whole thing makes no sense. Uh, and then another one, uh, person two. Uh, I went to King's College Hospital London for a procedure recently. It was about one third as busy as normal. It felt empty. But whilst waiting in the reception area, I overheard a conversation between a private healthcare worker uh, possibly a contractor and an NHS uh, worker on reception. The private healthcare worker was asking questions about how to perform a procedure on an elderly patient. It appeared that maybe uh, some of the staff working at the hospital were being asked to perform procedures without training and having to ask for instructions immediately beforehand. Why is this happening? Especially since the hospital was the quietest I've ever seen it. Uh, have the real NHS staff been furloughed? Well, we'll be talking about furloughing uh, later on. But these uh, two interesting statements that we've been sent uh, yesterday, Brian, uh, really highlighting this situation. Uh, this perhaps explains many of the uh, excess deaths uh, because people not getting the support that yeah. they need from the NHS because the NHS has simply been uh, reoriented towards COVID and everything else has effectively been shut down. So on this, I just want to highlight uh, this post here early june graphs from christopher Bo bowyer uh, this is uh, on the hectator hector drummond magazine uh, he has taken the same uh, office for national statistics information that i've been looking at and has uh, produced some really interesting uh, graphs on this and i thought i would just uh, let people see these um, so first of all nhs england hospital deaths with covid 19 uh, by absence or presence of a pre-existing condition and the absence of a pre-existing condition is the level the yellow bar the green bar showing the presence of a pre-existing condition and you can see that's for each age group it's pretty clear that uh, the vast vast majority of people with pre-existing conditions uh, and then the percentage of nhs england hospital deaths with covid19 uh, by pre-existing condition and showing the list of typical pre-existing pre conditions uh, for, for everything from uh, diabetes and dementia. Now, it's interesting that dementia is on that list, uh, Brian, because of course, uh, you know, you were reporting a day or two ago uh, that uh, people were being asked to make a decision about whether to be re uh, resuscitated or not, if, if that decision was uh, to be made. Um, how does somebody with dementia actually make that decision? I suspect those uh, people were having those decisions made for them. I would suspect so as well. <clears throat> and certainly we've been getting reports about some very strange um, things happening inside residential and care homes thanks to staff who are prepared to speak out um, right but this is uh, where it starts to get really interesting so this is uh, his analysis of the office for national statistics statistics care home deaths in england and wales now the blue bars at the bottom are the five-year average uh, the green bars uh, are uh, people that do not have covid these are not covid deaths and the orange bars are the covid deaths and it's pretty stark there, Brian, uh, the fact that there are so many people without COVID dying in care homes. Yeah, the, that, that peak of green deaths 
for the non-COVID, but they're still dying in excess of the uh, normal blue uh, figures showing there. What's caused that? Well, it's lock, it's lockdown, it's lockdown, it's right? Denial so, of so, services. So that's for care homes. Uh, this graph then is for people that have died at home, not in care homes, but in their own homes, and we see an even worse picture there. So this is showing the excess mortality and the green bars, which again are people that uh, do not have COVID. Uh, significantly larger proportion uh, do not than do for people that have died in their own homes. And this must ref reflect what person one was saying in that little comment that they sent to us. Uh, this is because the NHS has reoriented itself towards COVID to such a degree that everything else has basically been forgotten about. Uh, and, uh, and also on this, uh, which we'll look at a, a little less here, is the weekly recorded deaths with and without COVID by place of death. So I recommend people go and look uh, at this article and look at the graphs. It is extremely interesting uh, and give the, uh, the uh, article some support and some sharing. Uh, it, they deserve to have it shared because uh, otherwise people can't really understand uh, uh, the excess mortality figures. Yeah, and the strength of this, of course, is that it is based on the ONS figures. So it's not as if figures from elsewhere are being used. This is the government's own figures just being properly analysed. Yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, a couple of interesting developments. Uh, first of all, this is from ITV News. Bereaved coronavirus families call for public inquiry into the government's handling of COVID-19 pandemics. So this is families of more than 450 people uh, who have died from or with rather coronavirus have demanded a full public inquiry into the into the situation uh, this is the COVID-19 bereaved families for justice UK is the group uh, and they want an urgent review of life and death decisions um, and I do wonder to what degree an inquiry like that would start to to look at the sorts of questions that we've just been raising there uh, but in Spain it's uh, even more uh, significant uh, because this, uh, well, this uh, article here in Spanish, of course, but basically this is the uh, Spanish Association of Victims and Affected by COVID-19. They filed uh, a complaint against the Prime Minister, Pedro Sanchez, uh, for the crime of genocide with the International Criminal Court. They're accusing him of genocide of 50,000 people. Uh, this is the first sort of action of its type. It's being taken under the uh, Rome Statute. Uh, and what they're alleging is that Pedro Sanchez uh, has had an, uh, an indirect intent uh, because he didn't deal with the issue uh, in the way that it should be dealt with. And as a result, many, many people died again in care homes. Now, uh, the question is, is the situation in Spain any different to the UK? Why have people died? Well, I don't know the answer to that because I haven't been looking at, at the situation in Spain quite so closely. But if, if the situation is similar to the UK, then there are certainly questions uh, to be asked. Uh, and uh, so it's interesting that that action has been taken. And we can say that, that uh, if an investigation starts, of course, as we've seen in other investigations, that it, it can easily broaden out into unexpected areas. So an investigation is a good thing because it starts the, uh, um, the looking at what's actually happened. Um, now, I'd uh, like to uh, welcome Piers Robinson onto the programme. Uh, Piers, it's been a little while, uh, but uh, just bring us up to date with what's been going on uh, with your work into propaganda uh, and, uh, and the continuing attacks on you and your colleagues. Well, I mean, the work that we've been doing on the OPCW and all the leaks and the controversy over the alleged chemical weapon attack in, in Syria, Duma, uh, that work has all been ongoing, and as you're probably aware, more leaked documents have emerged. Uh, Ian Henderson, one of the OPCW inspectors, has testified at the UN Security Council, um, and uh, we've given presentations, House Commons, also presentations at academic uh, uh, formats, uh, regarding essentially the corruption of the OPCW investigation. It's, it's very clear now that the original investigators who were in Duma had established that it was likely to have been staged in some way, and that that investigation was then scuppered, was then uh, controlled and manipulated by people at a more senior level in the OPCW, it would appear, in order to generate that final claim from the OPCW that it, there were reasonable grounds to believe a chemical weapon attack had occurred in Duma. 
And there's been pre press coverage of this. There's been a large amount of documents released to WikiLeaks. And as I said, there's been testimony from uh, one of the inspectors. And also other material has surfaced in the public domain from people within the OPCW. So it's that big scam that is going on. But at the moment, um, those of us who are involved in it um, keep on being attacked we, by uh, mainstream media, by the Times newspaper. Uh, many of your viewers might be aware that over the last two years, um, and you can see a graphic which is just up, um, that was the first Times attack on the academics working, looking at propaganda in Syria. No, that, that this, was... sorry, Pierce, this, this actually ended up as a front page on the Times, which is a pretty incredible uh, situation. It's a pretty incredible amount of uh, attention that they're giving uh, you. Now, of course, that, that, particular, uh, that particular article came out just as, as you were making, uh, exposing the weapons, the chemical weapons attack on Duma and so on. Uh, but as well as that, uh, we were also running the media on trial uh, event with you. Uh, at, this, at around the same time. And that was followed up then with, with more uh, attacks, this time from the Huffington Post, uh, sometime later, renewing the smear campaign against you. Um, so who, who has been behind this? Well, the Times newspaper and the journalist Dominic Kennedy um, led the investigation on the original attack, which was quite literally published by the Times exactly the same time as the UK, US and France were bombing Syria in retaliation for the alleged attack in, in Douma. Um, and really over the last two years, there's been about 20 attacks now on the academics uh, and other people looking at Syria and looking at the propaganda operations. That's an extraordinary quantity of articles, primarily just two sources, the Huffington Post and the Times, Dominic Kennedy at the Times, and then Chris York at the Huffington Post. So there's quite a back catalogue there of what are essentially attack pieces, attempting, and it's very clear now, attempting to uh, stop us from continuing to research and to talk about uh, what happened at Duma. Uh, so they're obviously behind it. What we also know, interesting things, we, we know that Dominic Kennedy name appeared as one, in, as one of the UK clusters in the documents which were released over the Integrity Initiative, uh, which is, of course, the, the, the much discredited UK government propaganda operation. Uh, and we did put the question to Dominic Kennedy several times as to whether there was any involvement between the Times attack and the Integrity Initiative, and he just refused to answer the question. Um, well, um, the, 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 uh, the Middle East Eye here had an article uh, they calling it an exclusive British propaganda efforts in Syria may have broken UK law. I mean, do you do you agree with them on this? Um, on the material which has come out, at least I have seen it been around for, for a few years. It was initially published in the Guardian, um, and there is no doubt now that the UK government has been involved in uh, funding propaganda operations for opposition groups within Syria. So that's beyond dispute. Um, at the extent to which he's broken those laws which mentioned that article, I, I, I'll leave that to a lawyer. I think the, the broader picture is very clear that British involvement in the support for opposition groups trying to overthrow the Syrian government is quite clearly illegal um, in terms of international law. That's you know, arming groups uh, being involved in propaganda operations in relation to groups trying to overthrow a government is clearly a um, violation of international law. It's an attack on a country. And so on, um, and so that's clearly that's been clearly underway. What's been happening with us is is a pro what a, appears to be an attack on ac UK academics. Now, where this is coming from, as as I say, I mean there are also questions. Uh, Oliver Kahn, the Times uh, leader writer, made very clear in a tweet, and there was also an editorial in the Times that James Lemassuria, the former British military commander, who was uh, who has been involved in the propaganda operations in Syria and also so it has been involved in UK operations in Syria. Um, Oliver Kahn made very clear that the Syria had contacted Times and asked them to keep on the case of the academics. So there's a direct link there, obviously, being yes. admitted to. Um, so that's the picture which emerges, a, a picture which emerges of um, the Times newspaper having been involved in what appears to be a systematic campaign with some kind of link with the UK government, which they stated themselves, um, uh, through Benjamin Syria, 
um, attacking academics and continually smearing them. And in a context where, as, as we know, really broadly speaking, what we have been researching has been vindicated by events. Um, our initial skepticism and doubts over the alleged attack in Duma have been confirmed by multiple leaked documents, OPCW sources, inspectors, whistleblowers. It has also been reported in mainstream media, La Repubblica in, in Italy, The Mail on Sunday through Peter Hitchens, and also in, in the US, as well acro across many, many alternative media outlets. So you know, it's not just us, the academics, who, who have been... Um, raising questions and so on. Of course, we've been an important part of analyzing material and, and, and so on over time and, and pulling the material together. Um, but we've been attacked for doing something which um, is clearly an issue, and clearly an issue the Times should actually be reporting on. But of course, it hasn't. It hasn't reported on the leaks. It hasn't reported on the controversy, not in any significant way, over the OPCW investigation of the Duma report. Instead, it's taken its time to smear and attempt to destroy the reputations of, of academics who are very experienced, long-standing, employed at Russell Group universities and so on. So what this looks like is an attempt to suppress and close down a public discussion of an issue which is already out there. Um, but their, tactic, their preferred tactic is to um, try to silence the academic. Maybe they see us as a soft target in all of this. Uh, well, possibly. Now, look, uh, you mentioned the Integrity Initiative. If people want to find out a little bit more about uh, Integrity Initiative, then have a look at the Integrity Initiative section on the uh, on the UK Column website. But also, uh, Piers, uh, you uh, you and your colleagues have did work uh, uh, some spectacular work uh, on the Working Group on Syria Propaganda and Media website, uh, highlighting. Uh, integrity initiative and in this particular section you're you're pointing out the journalists that have been named uh, as as being part of that now the question is uh, how uh, integrity initiative uh, initiative itself seems to have gone relatively quiet at the moment but the question is uh, how much uh, attention is still being pushed into uh, British government propaganda going out into uh, against Russia in other countries and much of it has has come on to the UK itself, do you think, at the moment? Well, I think that that's the huge question in all of this. I mean, we know from the, the information which has surfaced in the public domain over COVID-19 and the role of uh, the 77th Brigade, um, which has now been publicly stated in terms of managing public perceptions of COVID-19, shows that you, you have a essentially a propaganda unit 77th Brigade, and they, they call it countering misinformation, but it's essentially you know, in historical uh, language a, a propaganda operation. Um, uh, that's targeting the UK public. So the question is whether that and other associated elements, the Rapid Response Unit in, in the Cabinet, which is overseen by Mark Sedwell, of course, the question inevitably arises to, as to whether there's any involvement of that with the attack on the academic. If I remember correctly, the Rapid Reaction Unit was set up in April 2018, when uh, around the time that the Duma event happened. Um, and, and I think that's the question. How much uh, are, is, is propaganda now being directed at the British public on issues such as COVID-19, but also in relation to all of these issues? And then how much of that propaganda also involves trying to silence and smear um, academics who are working on this, or anyone else who is raising questions about British foreign policy. You know, the cat's out of the bag on this. You know, the, the Middle East Eye article that you showed in Ian Cobain's research, and that's been quoted by, by other people as well now. You know, it's confirmed that the UK government's been sponsoring covert ops in Syria and propaganda operations in Syria and white helmets as well, etc., as, as everyone knows full well. Um, how much all of that activity and that covert war to try and overthrow the Syrian government has also involved propaganda targeting domestic population in the UK. It subverts democracy, obviously. Uh, it prevents the public from knowing the truth of what is going on. And it allows, in this case with the OPCW, it prevents people from really understanding the extent to which the OPCW has been compromised by the US, UK, and France. And in the case of Duma, where 50 
civilians, approximately 50, 50 civilians were killed, is preventing us finding out how they actually died. And as we made clear in, in our presentation in, in the House of Commons uh, event that we attended in January, um, it's the view certainly that is a very strong indication that those civilians were probably murdered okay, for the purposes. So this potentially is a war crime with a large number of civilians killed. And this is being buried. Being able to find out the truth of what happened, what actually happened to these people, is being prevented by people who are trying to stop academics and others researching the issue. This is a really important issue, and I, and I think everyone should perhaps reflect upon this and take the time to perhaps focus their minds that this is what we're talking about at the end of the day. We have civilians killed in, a, in an incident in Syria. It is not clear how they died. There are strong indications that they might have been murdered for the purposes. They weren't killed in a way which um, as it were, the U.S. and U.K. French government's claim from, from the chlorine attack. And that's a war crime. That's a very serious matter. This, this, these kind of things can end up in prosecutions and so on. Um, and us understanding this and getting to the bottom of it and understanding what actually happened is being hampered and prevented by mainstream media. Uh, absolutely. Um, but whether they know what they're doing in terms of what actually happened to Duma or not is, is, is unclear, witting or unwittingly. They are preventing sort of legitimate inquiry um, in, into this issue. And, and I think, you know, that's, that's a scandal in itself. What's happened in the OPCW is clearly a scandal, as, as has been reported across other media over the last year and has been seen in the leaks. But this is a big scandal that, um, that supposedly respectable media organizations have been involved in in that kind of activity, it's suppressing discussion and debate. Um, uh, well, well, look, Pierce, uh, you mentioned Mark Sedwell, so let's let's bring him on screen. Now we've shown variations of this uh, already, but I just want to remind everybody once again how powerful this man actually is. So he is National Security Advisor, and therefore head of the National Security Council, and therefore has uh, control of effective control of the. Uh, intelligence Services, GCHQ, S, uh, Security Service, Secret Intelligence Service, and the new Joint Biosecurity Centre that we'll be talking a little bit more about shortly. Um, but uh, the first hint of the counter disinformation uh, program internationally came with Andy Price's uh, counter disinformation and media development program within the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, which ultimately uh, comes under the remit of Mark Sedwell as well, because he's the head of the civil service. And it was that program which uh, was funding the Integrity Initiative and similar programs. Uh, and uh, then, of course, Mark Sedwell is also head of the Cabinet Office. And so he, therefore, has responsibility for this rapid response unit for the National Security Communications team, ultimately for 77 Brigade and 13 signals as well, uh, which are, and this is, I'm saying this forms effectively the UK government's propaganda network, both domestically and internationally. And I was just interested to get your thoughts on, on this and your thoughts on, on the fact that, that one man seems to have control over the whole thing. Well, I mean, I, I saw it reported actually in a Guardian article or perhaps it was even a Times article talking about Sedwell and, and his, his influence and, and power. And, and certainly from what you're presenting there, you seem to have a situation where an individual does have an incredible degree, potentially, of power over um, what is going on. Um, and this is clearly the anathemate democratic process. Um, there doesn't seem to be adequate in, in that graph that you have there, any sort of real adequate checks and balances. This is, and I'm being quite polite, I guess. I mean, this looks very, very dangerous. And if we're in a situation, if we're in a world, and as we saw with the COVID-19 example, where 77th Brigade um, to the UK military is, is being used to, um, to influence public opinion, um, you've got a pretty major breakdown in democracy if that is occurring. You have a, a, a propaganda operation going on right at the top um, and running through and, in a sense, controlling what people know and what people think about what is going on. Basic sort of uh, democratic principles, it, it violates that. And 
you know, from an international politics point of view, and as, as Woodrow Wilson after the First World War, these things are all dangerous when you don't have proper accountability and transparency of governments, um, the potential for corruption and for illegal wars, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, is very, very great. And I, I would suspect that's exactly the, the situation we're in. If we look at the wars the UK government has been involved in now for over the last 20 years, um, most of them illegal, <laughs> um, or certainly arguably very illegal conflicts from Iraq through to Libya, Afghanistan, um, and Syria as well. Um, that's a lot of warfare, a lot of fighting, and a lot of death and destruction. Um, and if it's being enabled through propaganda, deceiving people, manipulating perceptions, um, well, it, it shows what, what a dark corner we have got ourselves into at this point in time. But that picture and that graph you show and, and this kind of concentration of power and also this kind of ideology, this, this, what, what you see here with this kind of sort of, you know, communication strategies, countering disinformation. Well, they're going to see this countering disinformation, but it can easily slip into sort of disguising the truth of certain events. And, you know, that's the case in Syria, the, the, the war in Syria. You know, people have been very unaware of British involvement. And actually, in some ways, I think that the, the Ian Cobain Middle East Eye article was is some of the first stuff in recent years where you see this quite straightforward acknowledgement and confirmation of British involvement in these in this regime change operation. Um, this has been buried from the public mind. And of course, ultimately, this is this is very dangerous. This enables wars and it enables wars which are illegal and it enables wars which are destructive. And. I don't think anyone would doubt, and I think the Middle East Eye article and another piece in that magazine uh, said that, or made the argument that British sponsorship and involvement with opposition groups in Syria has, has fueled and exacerbated and worsened uh, the conflict in Syria. This is a, a very big moral issue and legal issue, I think, for the UK government. Uh, and I guess that's, that's why academics such as us who are raising the questions are getting attacked so hard. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, uh, we uh, we will see what uh, there is an attack coming. We believe uh, this weekend another one. Uh, we'll see what they they go with. Uh, but Pierce, thank you very much for joining us. Have you got uh, any? Yeah, just just to add, Piers, and of course, don't let that attack put you off because uh, it should generate more support from the public that can understand exactly what you're saying. So keep at it, please. Thank you very much, Pierce. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Um, OK, let's uh, let's quickly move on. Uh, if you like what the UK Column does and you would like to support us, then please head over to ukcolumn.org forward slash community. Uh, there are options to help us out there, and that would be very much appreciated. Now, uh, uh, David Noakes, uh, as everybody will know, is in prison at the moment. Uh, if you want to know the background for why he is in prison, uh, then th this article on the UK Column website will give it to you. GC MAF and the persecution of David Noakes, Lynn Thayer and Immunobiotech. Uh, well, we, uh, Brian, understand that uh, David has now uh, been told uh, in uh, particularly... Uh, Strange circumstances, yes, I think. Ba ba basically what has happened is that a prison warder has come into his cell yesterday and presented him with a piece of paper and said, uh, basically laughed at him and said, uh, well, you're off to France on Monday then. So David Noakes being uh, sent to uh, extradited to France uh, to, to face the same charges in France that he faced in the UK and, in fact, uh, did some prison time for in the UK. Yeah, so double jeopardy. It looks uh, like Brexit, it. of course, has achieved nothing because life goes on as as it always was with regard to relationships with France and the European Union. So that extradition proving, of course, that in, in the matter of law, things have not changed at all. Um, so, I mean, people might want to read that uh, UK column article. And if you think that, uh, that there seems to be a miscarriage of justice here, then you might want to write your M to your MP or do something uh, other, uh, something else to support uh, David. But in the meantime, uh, very little time to write to him at this stage because he'll clearly be leaving uh, on Monday. Uh, but this is the details if you want to. The prison number is A708. Uh, 1DY, HMP, Exeter, 30 New North Road, Exeter, EX4, 4EX, if you want to uh, send them messages of support. 
And we've also got, um, uh, well, this was sent in to us. It's, it's basically an idea for a letter that you may want to send your MP. Now, you may be thinking, well, what will that do? But our answer to that is that if enough people put pressure on their MPs, they can force them to ask questions. Those questions can often get interesting answers, which start a whole uh, stack of cards beginning to fall. So don't think you can't do anything. You need to do something in order to make something happen. Uh, we don't advocate sending a, um, a, a f um, what's the word, a pro forma letter. It's much better to write your own letter. But this was somebody here setting out the sorts of things that you can be saying. I'll just read some of them. The case of David Noakes and Linda Thyra is a national and international scandal. David and his biomedical scientist partner are being relentlessly prosecuted on account of having successfully treated some 9,000 people suffering from cancer and other diseases such as HIV and autism at two clinics in Guernsey in Switzerland using a naturally occurring immunoglobulin called GC-MAF at a fraction of the cost of chemotherapy and other conventional conventional treatments and as a result of this they're being threatened i'll just you can freeze your screen and have a look at this but i'll just come on so it's saying that basically we're calling on uh, dominic rab to intervene to stay this unlawful and untimely extradition but we're also urging for good measures matt hancock to look into this case particularly as cancer sufferers has been at the brunt of the lockdown recently it's surely time to consider the introduction of effective and economical natural remedies such as gc math into uk healthcare gc math could save the nhs many millions per year now i'm going to say i fully support this letter in what it's trying to do it's raising the issue of david noakes and lynn thyer but it's doing so in a very reasonable way it's also raising very good and simple points that if we started to use some of these alternative uh, methods of dealing with cancer we could save the nhs uh, millions of pounds um, that it would normally be paying for drugs from big pharma which don't work so if you write the letter you can sow the seeds into the minds of your mps they may do something they might not but we know that if we do nothing nothing happens absolutely so we encourage you to put that letter or equivalent to it in your own words be polite be persistent put these people under pressure uh, now on the uh, 3rd of june coming back to covid uh, for a little bit on the 3rd of june uh, neil ferguson uh, was giving evidence to the house of lords science committee uh, and uh, he was being challenged uh, on the situation in sweden and the fact that sweden uh, didn't have a full lockdown, anything like a full lockdown, and yet seemed to have comparable, if not better, results uh, to the UK. Now, it turns out they're having significantly better results than the UK, but as we'll come on to in a second. But let's just remind ourselves what uh, Neil Ferguson said. Thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, I'm, su I'm surprised by what Professor Ferguson just said about Sweden, and I'd like to come back to it before I move on to R and R naught, if I might, because Uppsala University took the Imperial College model, or one of them, uh, and adapted it to Sweden and forecast deaths in Sweden of over 90,000 by the end of May if there was uh, no lockdown uh, and 40,000 if a full lockdown was enforced. In fact, there have only been 4,350 deaths in Sweden till the end of May. This does seem to be a huge discrepancy and suggests there was something wrong with the model. We've heard today that on the whole, the models are thought to have performed well. That doesn't sound to me like they have performed well. Uh, and with, but we are looking okay, forward. Let, let it, let, let it um, so I, can I just maybe respond to that quickly? Um, first of all, they did not use our model. They developed a model of their own. Um, we had no role in parameterizing it generally. The key aspect of modeling is how well you parameterize it against the available data. But to be absolutely clear, they did not use our model. They didn't adapt our model. I mean, yeah, but, but surely the key point is that uh, without a lockdown, from what we've just heard from both Professor Ferguson and Professor Keeling, one would expect a relatively high uh, death figure in Sweden. It's in fact much lower than no, the I think I think that is an interesting question. It's clear that 
there have been significant has been significant social distancing in Sweden and our best estimate is that has led to a reduction in the reproduction number to around one. It's clear when you look at their mortality, they're not seeing the rate of decline that most European countries are seeing. But nevertheless, it is interesting that adopting a policy which is short of a full lockdown, they've closed secondary schools and universities, and there is a significant amount of social distancing, but it's not a lockdown. And they have got quite a long way to the same effect, albeit they, yeah, there's no evidence of really a rapid decline in mortality there in the same way as other European countries. And so that is something we are looking so that's something that they were looking at, uh, Brian. Well, they didn't seem to be uh, very chuffed about that particular uh, question and answer session. So uh, uh, Mr. Ferguson, or Professor Ferguson, was brought back to, the, to Parliament uh, on Wednesday afternoon uh, to the Co House of Commons Science Committee. Uh, and uh, well, there, as many people will have seen in the mainstream press, uh, he was presenting the notion that, in fact, uh, the reason for the, for all the deaths uh, was because we didn't start lockdown soon enough. That uh, he was arguing that he didn't appreciate how how widely uh, coronavirus had been seeded is is the, the language that he used, uh, and that uh, really it would have been better to start uh, earlier. But he also said this. Whilst I think the measures, given what we knew about the virus then in terms of transmission and its lethality, were warranted. I'm second guessing at this point, uh, certainly had we introduced them earlier, uh, we would have seen many fewer deaths. Now, Brian, I'm not, uh, what does second guessing mean? As, as far as I know, it means, it means you, that, you don't you, know. You, you're you, trying to think for an answer and you're guessing. Is you're, what you're, second you're making, guessing means. Yes, you're, you're making an assessment, a, a, a forecast based on a guess. Yeah, guess. So, so that seems to be an acknowledgement from Professor Ferguson that he effectively guessed. Uh, and he got it wrong. And as we've uh, pointed out uh, many times, and uh, and on Van Vanessa Bailey's article on the UK column website, of course, he has got his guesses wrong uh, many times before, uh, not least with uh, the foot and mouth epidemic. Um, so uh, should Professor Ferguson have anything whatever to do with uh, future policy in this area? I would suspect not. Well, I, I would say not. But what's interesting about the discussion is how all calm uh, it's been that we've shown it's it's gentlemen discussing the fact that tens of thousands of people have died seems to have escaped if you want to get near some passion we have to go away from uh, uk mainstream media we have to uh, look for uk column but also russia today here well we could have some debate about uh, what they're about but the headline here is very interesting professor lockdown ferguson uk's covid 19 czar admits crippling restrictions made no difference. And this is the key question, where's the outrage? Because where is the outrage? We are looking across the BBC, we're looking across the newspapers in UK, tens of thousands of elderly people have died as a result of lockdown that has come in due to this man's policy and there's no outrage. Well, the outrage seems to be diverted in a different direction, perhaps. It, it, it certainly does. So the, the key headline here, still unanswered by the BBC and the wider media and press, and we've got to say, why is this? So looking at this article, um, this is uh, what was covered in the RT one. They said, uh, quoting Neil Ferguson, um, they, the Swedish scientists, came to a different policy conclusion based really on quite similar science. I don't agree with it, but scientifically they're not far from scientists in any part of the world. That's a very interesting statement. Keep that in mind. Uh, he then acknowledged that the Swedish authorities had got a long way uh, to the same effect without a full lockdown, mm. without a full lockdown. So that's interesting. Now, the point we are interested in is that this article in Russia today, written by former feature writer with the Irish Daily Mail called J Jason O'Toole, and he's got some interesting comments. He said this, in other words, in the type of roundabout waffling way you'd expect from a bumbling boffin, the scientist dubbed Professor Lockdown after he cajoled Boris Johnson into bringing the British economy to a screeching halt, reckons Sweden has essentially coped very well without being forced into any draconian lockdown. Thank you very much. 
and uh, he backs it up with the statistics that he had available at the time that the UK had achieved 579 COVID-19 deaths per million of population while Sweden with no restrictions businesses and the economy kept open was less at 442 deaths per million and indeed that situation is much worse today's figure is 608 deaths per million in the UK which vastly outstrips well not vastly but it significantly outstrips even Italy and Spain yeah. certainly outstrips uh, uh, Sweden and I think the only European country that is worse uh, is Belgium uh, for particular reasons but but uh, you know 608 deaths per million is well ahead of just about any other country on the planet and since it's the same virus in both countries we've got to say that it's what's taken place in UK that's done the damage so let's see what he says this is the key thing he says where was the indignation about his recommendations effed up the economy and made people prisoners in their own homes it certainly wasn't uh, to be seen splashed across any British front pages indeed it was hard enough to find much if any coverage of this very significant news story on Wednesday so he's he's spot on here where is the outrage where's the indignation where's the questions over the press and the media and the BBC in UK well there's nothing there's a wall-to-wall -wall silence so there's definitely a media conspiracy going on in order to keep this away from the the public mind now, I have to say uh, just RT has published that as an opinion piece. They also published an opinion piece by Piers Robinson in the last couple of weeks. But in general, RT, unfortunately, have been on the same page on the issue of COVID-19 as just about every other British mainstream media outlet. And, and uh, one of the articles that they had was sort of almost praising the World Health Organization for suggesting there's more to come. Absolutely. Staying though on what this gentleman has said, let's look at the Telegraph and he pointed this out in the article that when the Telegraph reported uh, this amazing situation that Sweden doesn't lock down but we do, we do to destroy our economy, it's not on the front page out of outrage, it's tucked away on page seven of the Telegraph. You can read a bit of it before it goes behind the uh, paywall. But uh, what isn't in this article in any shape or form is any outrage that UK is being destroyed as a result of a deliberately inflicted policy. So if we just jump back to uh, Jason O'Toole, he added this. He said, and here's one for the conspiracy theorists. Instead of wanting to throw Bojo under the bus, could it have been a case of wanting to hide something else that's about to come down the track with America now burning in the wake of the atrocious murder of George Floyd? The confession at this juncture reminds me somewhat of how a British government spin doctor sent out a memo only 30 minutes after the second plane hit the Twin Towers on 9-11 with a cynical recommendation that it's now a very good day to get out anything we need to bury. And of course, that was the senior Labour activist, uh, the lady Jo Moore. Um, so what is coming down the track? Well, the UK column wants to give our viewers and listeners an update as to what we've been talking about. So let's bring it up on screen. What is coming down the track and why do you need to know about it? Very quickly, we've warned in a pretty comprehensive analysis the dangers of Bill Gates uh, behind government policy over COVID, but of course sponsoring Imperial College and, and thereby helping um, Mr Ferguson with millions and millions of dollars donated directly into Imperial College. Uh, but of course, people also working through on the SAGE group also being financed by this gentleman. Uh, Professor uh, Chris Whitty, the chief medical officer, he got money to do with a malaria project in Africa, so certainly relations very easy. But we've also warned about this. Back in 2013, we highlighted that UK government said it was going to unleash behavioural psychology to change the way the public thought and behaved. And of course, if you're going to do that, you're going to control the media. And what have we got in this uh, present COVID uh, episode uh, we've got here that the government's applied behavioral psychology team uh, said we needed to up the use of fear to get the covid message across 
Uh, it also said that consideration should be given for the use of social disapproval, turning one section of the community against another. And um, we also know, of course, that it has killed off tens of thousands of elderly people. So central to the propaganda from the government has been deaths of people, but no outrage. On top of it, Mike, you've highlighted the intelligence and the information, the data gathering through to the NHS. And uh, we've also just covered it yet again, the fact that we've now got this lot of um, security people and the army uh, now alongside that data gathering and AI in the NHS. And uh, we can also say that the fusion doctrine we warned about over a great many months showing that something was happening to democracy in this country which wasn't declared. We'll add that to the mix. Other people have pointed out that Cummings has been up to the repurposing of government and we've also reported on that. But the quote here from True Publica was that this government wants the chaos because the chaos is the key to the change. And uh, we bring in where it's heading. Well, where is it heading? It's heading following the repurposing of government society to the reset, which The Guardian was admitting here via the World Economic Forum. And of course, Charlie Boy. So what's coming down the track is immensely dangerous because we've got the complete change of democracy in UK on the back of COVID and the fact that ultimately this forms part of a change worldwide through the reset. People need to understand what this is and why the government isn't talking about it. Uh, we'll cover that significantly more uh, in the coming days and weeks. Now, in the meantime, of course, uh, uh, COVID-19, we've all got to keep apart. Social distancing, lockdown continues, uh, but the lockdown is resulting in absolute economic collapse. So let's just uh, put some scale on this then. Uh, so the Office for National T Statistics released some, some numbers uh, yesterday or today, sorry. Uh, and in April, we've had a 20.4% uh, reduction in GDP in one month. Uh, this is following a fall of 5.8% in March. Uh, and uh, so this is the worst monthly fall ever recorded. Uh, well, they began this type of recording in 1997. Uh, but as you can see there in the middle of this, so that is from 1997, that graph. And you can see in the middle there, Brian, the, uh, the collapse around 2007, 2008. Now, everybody knows what that felt like. Um, and so you can imagine, therefore, what we're how we're going to start feeling uh, in the coming days, weeks and months uh, with a 20.4% 20 collapse in GDP in one month. Now, of course, uh, maybe we don't have to worry because the Office for Budget Responsibility claims that there's going to be some kind of magical dead cat bounce uh, at the end of this. And we're going to bounce right back up to where we were before. Nobody that's uh, thinking rationally actually believes that. Uh, but uh, th this, we begin to see the enormity of the economic devastation that's been caused. And just another way to look at this then, uh, the percentage of, uh, so this is for the Centre for Cities has uh, published uh, these statistics, uh, the percentage of people furloughed in various towns and cities around the country. Uh, so Crawley is the worst, uh, of course, uh, Crawley close to Heathrow Airport, 33.7% of, of working age people in Crawley are furloughed at this point in time. Uh, how many of those people will come back into jobs? It, it's impossible to say, but probably very few. Burnley, 30%, Slough, 27%, Sunderland, 26%, Birmingham, 26%, Hull, 25%, Luton, 25%, Doncaster, 25%. Plymouth actually is sitting around the 20% mark, Brian. So uh, this is immense economic devastation. Uh, as a direct result of the lockdown. And if we've been talking about excess mortality as a direct result of the lockdown, I would suggest we haven't seen anything yet. Because more is going to come off the back of this. More is going to come off the back yeah. of this. We're going to see inevitably deaths as a result of, of the, the lack of uh, tax income that's coming in. But as well as that, we're going to see suicides and other health related health issues coming from the stress. Uh, and the uh, well mainly from the stress that people are experiencing as a result of all this yeah
And uh, just to back that up, because you're giving the real facts there, Moy, for how bad it is and how bad it's going to get, just have a look at how the BBC is dealing with this. So this is the web page from earlier this morning. UK economy shrinks record 2.4%. That's just in the left of your screen. Uh, they're feasting on the breakup of UK economy, but there isn't a single key question being asked as to why this has happened. Um, in that article, UK economy shrinks, um, something very interesting pops up. Let's just have a look at it. Um, I've said that it's treating the UK public as complete idiots, and I think it is. Uh, the whole economy down 20%. Look what the BBC is trying to say is important. So there's the headline. And in the article, when you're about a halfway through it, you see a picture of this lady. Note the little subliminal staying positive. The whole economy is uh, falling apart, but there's the subliminal staying positive. And what do we know? Well, we've got to stay positive because this lady who runs a health club chain is commenting on what's happening in the economy. This is a health club chain. This is with great respect to the effort she's put into her business. This is not going to keep the British working population on their feet. Well, you can say they say three firms are still positive despite the crisis. Who does the BBC show? Well, a lady who's running a specialist Japanese ice cream making firm. Good. Supplying restaurants. She comments. She's still positive. Supplying restaurants? Yeah. But there aren't going to be any restaurants Indeed, left. Mike. And we've got an estate agent. So those are the three example firms that are going to keep Britain running. Uh, great examples of a productive economy there. Uh, absolutely. So the BBC swallowing up 4.3 billion in its budget. Is this a BBC accident? Did they make a mistake in reporting this? Or is this 4.3 billion of propaganda by design? We say it's got to be by design. And uh, if we want to ram this home, even LBC Radio is now picking up on the lies of the BBC. This is from their website, where they are now also showing interest that the BBC doctored a Reuters image of the recent black protests. On the left of the screen, circled, you can see a man facing the police. But what the BBC had cut out was the fact that he had a sort of four foot long stick which he was wielding at the police. So we know that the BBC is now pushing out the propaganda and lying to deceive the public. Why are they doing it? Presumably to help that repurposing, Mike. Uh, absolutely. Uh, but uh, don't worry, uh, the, bubbles, the bubbles are being blown because we're all going to be in bubbles. Uh, 300 million pounds uh, going towards blowing bubbles. Uh, this is local authorities in England, uh, just across England, have been given uh, 300 uh, million pounds between them to support the new test and trace service. Uh, local authorities absolutely central to the test and trace service. Uh, and each upper tier local authority has now been awarded funding to develop ta tailored outbreak control plans, uh, working with the NHS and other stakeholders. Uh, and so they're going to work on local outbreak control plans. Uh, and what's this about, Brian? This is uh, the fusion doctrine uh, in action. Yeah, central government coming to the lowest, to the lowest possible, possible level. Yeah, level. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we will keep an eye on that and keep you posted on it. Uh, but in the meantime, just to end the program, uh, we'll we'll mention uh, uh, NATO again because next week it's a busy week. Next week in the preparations for war. Uh, on Tuesday is the EU foreign ministers meeting on defence. Uh, and uh, well, that's uh, the EU is going to be responsive and prepared. It's going to be resilient. It's going to do all these kinds of things. I hope it's going to be alert, Mike. Oh, absolutely, it should be alert. Uh, so uh, EU ministers are going to discuss EU operational engagement, including force generation and gradual resumption of common security and defence policy missions, uh, including PESCO uh, and uh, also financial human resources. So that's they're also going to have a steering board meeting for the European Defence Agency. So they're pushing forward post-COVID with uh, getting the Defence Union back up and running. That's on Tuesday. Uh, on Wednesday and Thursday, then we have the NATO Defence uh, Ministers meeting. Uh, and then on uh, Thursday uh, and Friday, we have this, the Copenhagen Democracy Summit for 2020. This is the Alliance of Democracies. Uh, fantastic stuff. This is, of course, uh, being run via the EU. 
Uh, and, uh, well, it's all about China. So the EU, not really sure whether they want to be friends or enemies with China, but to make sure that they're going to be enemies with China uh, this uh, at this event, uh, Mike, uh, Mike Pompeo is going to be there. There he is. He's going to be speaking. Uh, other people speaking, Madeleine Albright, John Kerry, and uh, a whole host of other people. It's all very exciting stuff. But the point is that Pompeo will be, uh, his topic is going to be China and the challenge to free societies. So we've heard some really strong rhetoric, from anti-Chinese rhetoric over the last uh, few weeks from Pompeo. And it, that he is over here, I believe, to make sure that the EU at least uh, walks away from their any suggestion that they might want to uh, be friendly with China. We made the point on Wednesday's program uh, that uh, NATO 2030, which again will be discussed at the NATO Defence Minister's meeting, is expanding NATO's remit out of Europe and into the uh, South China Sea, bringing uh, Australia, New Zealand and, and other Asian countries into NATO. Uh, so we're seeing NATO expand to encircle China as well. This is the main focus at the moment, China. Yeah. We'll end, we'll, leave it there. we'll end there, I think. Um, now, somebody said while we were just finishing off a few minutes ago that essentially from the look of what we are reporting, we, the country, are FC UK'd. I disagree with this completely because the key thing is that people can't fight what they don't understand. When enough people can see what's being done, the propaganda, the lies, the spin, this is 90% excuse me, ninety percent of getting the lid off what's happening. So don't sit there and take it in. Spread the word as to what's happening. Talk to other people and push for your elected representatives to do something. Enough people push, you will find things change. Because if MPs think they're going to escape the system that's coming, they're very wrong. The revolution always eats its young. And I'll just come back, if I may, Mike, to Piers Rob Robinson's uh, comments there. He was talking about the suppression and closing down of public discussion. He was talking about the management of public perception. Mm. He was talking about propaganda directed at the British public. This is the situation of UK. If you're listening from a country, if you're overseas, this is the reality of UK. We've got a government of occupation using propaganda and applied psychology on people. How do we get the lid off that? Talk about it, spread the word, wake people up. And indeed, that's uh, probably what social distancing is actually all about, to stop people talking to each other. In those circumstances, you've got to be talking more, not less. You've got to be talking more. And while you're stood two metres apart, you might like to mention the Daily Mail article today which has finally declared that the two metre is not a rule. It's certainly not a rule at law. It is simply guidance that was given out. You don't have to obey it. So that's stated very clearly uh, within the Daily Mail article. So the truth is coming to the surface. Give it a push and help it. Mm. We'll end there. We'll see you at the same time on Monday. Bye-bye.